Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Jackie Guzman. I'm president-elect of the Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley. And the Latina Coalition educates, prepares, and connects Latinas in the areas of civic engagement and leadership development as an expression of our shared values of service, commitment, and our appreciation for the Latinas who've paved the way for our successes. I want to thank all of our partners that made this event possible. We have uh, the Latino Leadership Alliance, the Santa Clara County Office of Women's Policy, who I believe um, is provided our, our uh, meals and our space, so thank you so much for that. Um, we also have California Women Lead, um, and the office of Governor Jerry Brown, um, all partners. So we wanted to thank them, and we also um, wanted to thank our, uh, our funder. These are made possible by um, a generous grant from the YWCA of the Mid Peninsula's Donor Advice Fund. So we want to definitely thank our funders. And I believe now we will have somebody from um, LLA and um, and LCSV LLA. And a little bit of our mission with LLA and Latina Coalition is really combining the forces of professional Latinos in the area and making a difference. So round of applause for everybody. This is definitely a true partnership and collaboration amongst several organizations and we're really happy that we could offer this uh, opportunity to all of you tonight. So um, I want to go ahead and jump into our program. Uh, by introducing Rachel Michelin, who is the Executive Director and CEO of California Women Lead. And Rachel works with board, uh, a board of directors to develop and implement a strategic plan enabling California Women Lead to take its programs to women in all parts of the state. Much of her time is spent traveling, speaking to women about the importance of having more female representation in all levels of government. In 2006, Rachel was appointed to the El Dorado County Board of Supervisors to chair the Economic Advisory Committee for El Dorado County. When her term expired in 2008, Rachel was appointed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to the Public Security Disciplinary Review Committee North. Rachel also served on the El Dorado County Transportation Citizens Advisory Committee in 2009. In 2008, Rachel ran for a seat on the El Dorado County Board of Supervisors. Although not successful, she did learn valuable lessons that enable her to be even more effective in encouraging women to become politically engaged. And that's why we have her here tonight. So Rachel received her BA in Communications with a minor in Political Science from CSU Fullerton, and she lives in El Dorado Hills with her husband and two young daughters. So I was very happy to uh, take part in, in the training by Emerge and actually see Rachel's presentation on uh, boards and commissions and the appointments process, and thought that this was really something that we had to bring to San Jose and to all of our uh, community leaders and, and up and coming leaders. So thank you very much, Rachel, for being here. Thank you, and I, I have to add that I was just recently reappointed by Governor Brown to the Private Security Disciplinary Review Committee. Anyone know what that is? Anyone? Not you, you don't count. Anyone have any idea? I'll say it again, Private Security Disciplinary Review Committee. Huh? Well, we're gonna talk about it. I hear appeals, um, from security guards who have had their licenses revoked or denied by the state of California. Now, you probably don't know me that well, but you know me enough that what do you think of my resume correlated with private security guards? And when I first got appointed, I did the first thing everyone does, which is I Googled it, because I have no idea what the commission was. But I will tell you what the brilliant thing, thing about serving in appointed office is that what I love about it is it's completely out of my comfort zone. I knew nothing against, uh, about private security guards, about the business. I'm an expert now. I have my badge. I know what the, <laughs> the rules are. And, and I'll tell you, um, I'm the public member. And one of the best things in California in particular on a lot of these boards and commissions is that there are seats for public members, people who are there to represent all of you. So I represent all of you on this commission. And when I first got appointed, I served with two gentlemen. They were both former police officers. One owns a security company, one's a private investigator. I did tell my husband, be careful now, I've got connections with a private investigator. But, um, 
But I, I, I felt like, what do I know? I know nothing. And I, I, I sit at a table like this, and we do our hearings, and both of them said, you realize you're the most important person on this commission. And I'm thinking, what? How, how am I? I don't, I mean, they're rattling off California code and penal code, and I'm just trying to keep up. And I realized something. They go into police officer mode. It's kind of like law and order, you know, and they're interrogating these people. I look at it as I have a five-year-old and I have a nine-year-old. And when we're at the mall or we're at, at some public event, to them a security guard is a police officer. And they're going to go up to that person and they're going to ask them for help. Do I want that person within six feet of my children? And when I realized that I come in with that perspective, it changed everything for me. And I have loved being on that commission, loved it so much I got reappointed. And um, it's really a, a testament to why the appointments process is so important. And we're gonna start our panel and, and all of these folks have served locally, I served locally, very different, but just as rewarding. And what's, what's wonderful about appointments is that you can find something that fit your schedule, fit your interest, and really help you, particularly if you, if you have aspirations to run for office or be more engaged in your community. But I'm gonna tell you, what do you think the first rule is to getting appointed, whether it's at the local level or the state level? There's one rule you have to keep in order to make that happen. Does anyone know what it is? You have to apply. <laughs> Um, as much as I would love to think that the governor has looked at me and realized what a great asset I would be to his administration, very rarely, and I know Mary is here, and she may, on occasion, he may pick up the phone, but he's, he, he needs you to apply. She needs you to apply. The appointment secretary needs you to apply. And I will tell you that we, we work very closely with the governor's office because we have a goal, 51% of his appointments will be women. That's our goal. But, but I'll tell you, I can't be giving Mona and her staff a hard time, or I can't be giving the governor a hard time if we don't have enough women who are willing to step up and to apply. And I know there's some gentlemen in here, and, and we need you to apply too, um, but, <laughs> but uh, it just really is, a, a, I've done so many of these trainings over the years, and I've yet to have anyone email me. I get a lot of wonderful emails. I, no one has said, Rachel, you know, what were you talking about? This is the worst thing I've ever done, because it's such a rewarding experience. So with that, we're gonna jump into uh, the panel, because I can go on and on about appointments. Um, and I wanna thank all of them for joining us, and I'm just gonna quickly go down the road. I think, whoa, all them. Um, give you the mic and just have you um, introduce yourself let people know you know what position you either are serving in or have served in and maybe give us one thing you love most about the commission that you have been or are involved with good evening uh, my name is Raul Perales and I currently serve as a uh, human relations commissioner with Santa Clara County and uh, and I've been on for about a year and a half and a little over a year and a half and before I got on, I didn't even know commission the committees existed. Uh, I learned about them a few months before I got on. Uh, so even just the, the realization that there's an organization like this, the commissions or committees to be able to, to serve and get back to your community, um, that, was, that was exciting enough for me. Uh, and that has, has kind of even still been the number one thing, just the fact that I can serve my community in this capacity. Um, and being on, in particular, the Human Relations Commission, uh, we deal with things that are that are real specific to kind of my core beliefs, my core values. Um, you know, discrimination, racism, sexism. Um, you know, you name it across the board. It, it's those core issues that that you know mean something to me, and that's specifically why I picked this commission. And so that's the thing I really love about it.
Good evening. My name is Christina Ramos, and I'm um, a director of a nonprofit, educational nonprofit in Silicon Valley, actually out of San Jose State University. And I not only manage a board, but I also sit on a board. So I have double perspective here. Um, I, um, when I became director, I had a non-existing board, or a non active board, I should say, and I wanted to learn how to make it active again and how they can, what their role is actually in serving the community I serve or the community I work for. And so from there, working in the community is kind of my, already my passion. And it was about two years ago, um, I uh, learned about what boards, other boards and commissions are and what they were doing. And so I did a training with, um, um, called Let's see, Latino Board Leadership Academy is LBLA for short, through the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley. And it got me more active. And through other colleagues like myself, learned about commissions. And so then, so now I'm a board member of Latino Coalition of Silicon Valley. I sit on a bonds commission for the Allen Rock School District. And I'm also a recently appointed commissioner for the uh, San Jose Libraries and Early Child Education. And I have my application in for the Human Relations Commission. <laughs> and not to say that <laughs> none of these are important or I'm overachieving, but it's all causes I really believe in and really um, found an interest in. And I uh, have the time, and I have the commitment, and I have the passion. And I realized um, by joining the commission, there weren't that many Latinos on these commissions, and there also aren't that many women on these commissions. In fact, I recently went to a library's commission with um, other members who support libraries, and I was the youngest, I was the only Latina, and uh, I was shocked by what my peers in that room were saying that were coming out of their mouths. So it's really, it was really important for me to have a voice and to be the voice of my community at that meeting. So um, that is why I do what I do. Good evening. My name is Mary Ann Ruiz and I am on the Santa Clara County Planning Commission. I'm the immediate past chair. And I've been serving on the Santa Clara County Planning Commission since about 2006. I've been appointed by two different supervisors, county supervisors. Uh, previously, I had served on the Parks and Recreation Commission for the City of San Jose. I was appointed in 2002. And I've also served on the Sunshine Task Reform Committee for the City of San Jose about 06 and 07. And I've served on the Bay Conservation Development Commission, BCDC, about 06 through 08. And I've served on various boards. And uh, your question is, uh, what do I love about it? I'm going to say two things. Uh, one, I also love um, that I'm serving the community. That is very, very important to me, that the community, uh, our diverse communities, have a voice in the process. Um, that's important to me uh, personally because I grew up with stories um, from my mother and grandmother where uh, women and um, people of color were shut out of the process. And so I see that as a very important to me personally, serving on a commission, that um, it's a fair and open process and communities um, have the ability to be a part of it. That's really important. Uh, secondly, uh, what I love is being a woman on a commission uh, particularly when I've been in leadership such as chair or vice chair uh, and I've been approached by women and by uh, staff for example uh, by the county who have um, really appreciated women being in leadership positions so um, I, I, I love serving on commission. Thank you. Good evening. Wow those are some, some tough acts to follow but I'll try. So, my name is Joshua Bruce. Uh, professionally, I uh, serve as a field representative for the California State Senate in the office of uh, Senator Jerry Hill. Uh, currently serve on the City of San Jose's Human Services Commission. I was initially appointed to the uh, City of San Jose's Human Rights Commission, uh, the city in order to, to bridge the, the, the budget shortfall gap. They consolidated a number of commissions, including the Human Services Commission, Human Rights Commission, along with the uh, Disability Advisory Committee, 
to the larger uh, Human Services Commission. So I, I was actually appointed in uh, June of 2010. I served as the chair the last two years. Uh, so we haven't had an election for, for chair for, for the new board, but you know, I'd like to let somebody else you know, take on the reins and you know, really get a unique experience. But I also serve as president of Silicon Valley Young Democrats, uh, chair of the, the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee for the Eastside Union High School District. Also, uh, I have the privilege of serving on the uh, Independent Police Auditor Advisory Committee. Um, also, uh, Latino Leadership Alliance Cohort too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's uh, my pleasure to be here in Sonora to serve you know, with, the, with these panelists. Um, I think the thing I enjoy the most about serving on a commission, don't, I don't mean to beat the dead horse, but it's a good opportunity to really pay it forward or give back to a community that, you know, that really helped me and you know, really want to Again, we are that voice, we are that sounding board. We're out in the communities and we can act as a sounding board, make those valuable recommendations to the council on those, those issues that are important to us. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I guess we can start rolling. actually serve on the Human Rights Commission of San Jose. And um, I figured out that during that process, um, they were doing that restructuring, so I was constantly trying to keep in contact. I, I did go online, so I went online to the city's website and um, pulled up the application and submitted it to the county clerk by the certain time, by the deadline they like. They have deadlines, right? So I made sure, and I think I was like, when I finally looked it up, it was like, maybe two days before <laughs> and so um, so I looked up the deadlines did all that and um, went through the then they call you for an interview process so you're interviewing with a panel of people asking you why do you want to serve and obviously it was for me to serve my community then they went through restructuring so I pretty much got denied <laughs> to be on the um, panel um, later um, for this recent commission for the libraries commission um, I did the same thing. I went, I was constantly searching online to see what commissions were, had their vacancies um, through the city of San Jose and through the Santa Clara County. Um, the city of San Jose currently had some openings for the early, uh, the libraries and early child care commission. And so what I did through that is um, I followed the guidelines that were on the website and then I contacted the city council member whose vacancy it was and their office and I said I'm submitting my application um, for your review if you can put it in front of the council member and they said within 30 minutes I got a response like yes y you will have a response and then I got a call from my city council member saying uh, I put your, your application through so uh, so it's important to reach out to the city council member or whoever that uh, seat of office is um, who that vacancy holds because um, if you get in contact with them, they will follow up with you. And that was important to me, which is currently what I'm doing right now for the uh, seat for the Commission of Human Relationship is constantly, are constantly being in contact with that office to make sure that they got my application, to make sure that it's in front of someone to submit that, um, that representative. Yeah, right, exactly. So yeah, that relationship is essential. If especially how many here how many people here actually live in San Jose? So I think the majority of us do. Um, so if you want to apply to a commission, I mean regardless of what level, you should establish a good relationship with your representatives. Especially for the city of San Jose, uh, you know, those are the folks because you have to, now from my understanding the new structures they have to be 
uh, the, the way they're delegated is by geographic diversity through each council district. So again, through all, all your, uh, your elected representatives, you should establish a good relationship with them and give them a heads up that you are submitting an application. From there, you know, they can put in a good word for you. If they feel inclined, they could submit a letter of recommendation. They can put in a phone call. Uh, for example, my experience, uh, the council liaison was not my council representative, but uh, I, I called my, my council representative and gave her a heads up that I was applying. From there, she actually put in a good word, and from there, it really helped. Um, was there a second part to that question? Well, like, how do you develop a relationship with your, if you don't know or have a relationship with your <coughs> Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh, they're all. You know, they all signed up to serve. They're. You know, they're to serve you. So, and majority of of, uh, of members, so they really they are excited to hear, especially young people, women, people of color. They're they're glad that these folks wanting to put themselves in leadership roles. So, you know, to simply just reach out. You can reach out, call their office. Um, you know, send them an email, drop by, whatever you, you know, whatever you feel most comfortable doing. You know, you, you're gonna have to take the initiative, be proactive, reach out to them, let them know that you want to put yourself in, you know, in this role, and you know, they see it as a benefit to help them as well, since you know you're gonna be the eyes and ears of the district. So, yeah, you know, I think it's essential that you do establish that relationship, you know, either before you apply or during the application process. My prior um, role on boards and commissions had a significant role in me being on the planning commission uh, because I was actually approached by the supervisor's office to be on the planning commission. And um, what happens is, is on the planning commission, you're right, it is very different because I've also had the experience where I applied to be on the parks commission, but on the planning commission, um, and in the county's planning commission, each supervisor appoints a person. And so it, that's where it gets political because your person, your appointee, is on the planning commission. And who do you want on the planning commission? And um, in my case, the supervisor, it was Supervisor Alvarado at the time, uh, contact their, her office contacted me and said uh, the supervisor is looking for someone who has uh, environmental or resource management background. I have a, a bachelor's and master's in environmental management and policy. She's looking for someone um, of color in her district and uh, preferably uh, a woman. And so, and someone who has been active in the community. You know, by then I had been very involved in boards and commissions. And so that was, you know, would you be interested? And I said, yeah, I, I would be, very much so. Um, but being on the planning commission, I have seen um, a lot of politics about who is appointed. And the makeup of a planning commission is very important too. And most of the times, supervisors, I think councils look at that because for example, on our commission now, um, at least half are developers. And so if you have, for example, if you have all developers on a commission, what are your land use issues going to be based on? It's going to most likely be on development. If you have uh, environmentalists or uh, resource conservation background, you're going to have a different discussion. And so they do look at, um, the supervisors look at uh, what are the qualifications, what are they bringing to the table, they look at men and women. and. When we have a vacancy, I'm always one of the ones saying, it would be great if we had another woman commissioner. <laughs> and so um, there are politics, uh, a lot of politics to planning commissions, and I think even more so on the city level.
And I was I was actually appointed about a year and a half ago. So, but it was still recently, and uh, and it was brand new to me because, I, like I said, I hadn't known anything about commissions or committees before about a month before I applied. Uh, and so, being so new to it, um, you know, they a lot of times like you know saying knowing somebody or something. It's about who you know, uh, not necessarily that case, because if you don't know somebody, it's about who you get to know. Uh, and so I started wanting to, to be more involved in, on a political level within the community uh, and I already was on, on social levels. And so I started going around and just kind of with different groups with uh, you know the Silicon Valley Young Democrats uh, and met Joshua over there. You know, different groups on, in, a, in a political field and that's how I learned about uh, even the commissions and committees. And so not knowing anything about them beforehand, uh, I did a couple of things. One initially was just go to the internet and to look into you know, the different commissions and committees. And there was a form over there, you guys will see, and there's like 35 or so different or something on, on here. But there's 79 different uh, commissions or committees at the county level. Uh, and not all of them are ones where it's, you know, fully community members. Some of them are where their they're actual board of supervisors are on these. But there's so many of them, right? When I, when I went and looked, um, initially, I was just educating myself on what existed. Uh, and then I went out into the actual community and, and asked other people, like, hey, what, you know, people that I knew that either served or asked them if they served so I could learn more about the actual, you know, what it, what it entailed, what, you know, what kind of responsibilities there were, um, what they actually did. Uh, and, and then when I looked into actually applying myself, I went straight to just something that, you know, hit the heart, you know, and so I looked through all the different commissions in, and when I read up there the bio on the Human Relations Commission, that's when I said this this resonates with me. Uh, and so I did my homework on that. Uh, and then to to prepare for it, it was, I was really unknown. I didn't do maybe what I think would be a good idea to do, which is to actually go to one of these meetings first. Uh, because then you actually can see these meetings are public and they, they you know, put out when the meetings will be, uh, you know, and, and the times and the dates and the locations. And so if I would have prepared a little more, I would have actually went to one of the meetings before being appointed or before even applying because then I would have seen what it was like. I, I didn't know what, uh, you know, the Brown Act was, Robert's Rules, I had no clue what that stuff was. You know, so I get appointed, I come in and I'm, I'm getting slapped in the face with this stuff and there may be people here and don't know what those are. Uh, and, you know, and so I was, there were things that I was learning that I think if I had gone to at least a couple actual meetings to the commission that I wanted to be on beforehand, I would have been that much more uh, prepared. Uh, but otherwise, doing your homework online, speaking with other people that are there, um, were definitely helpful. That's funny you mentioned the Brown Act. When I was on the Eldorado Economic Development Advisory Committee, we didn't know the Brown Act applies to email. So we would email each other, and the next thing we know, we get a call from County Council. We all got brought into a room and educated on the Brown Act. So it, it is, things like that. So let's talk a little bit about that, touching on that. Maybe with what you're doing and also how it relates to what the district is doing or the school district is doing. I think that was um, a mind opener because I, I, ha I thought, I guess going into it, that we would have at least some communication with uh, the school board and the superintendent and then we found out it was their staff and, and the relationship between the in-between of the commission and the you know, the representatives of that school district, you know, we were like very confused. It was very confusing. And then um, 
and maybe because we're still not a full committee as we should be and how little participation there is as of of committee members that's hard to work with as well so that i mean those are some those are really negative things but at the same time i feel i feel like um what an eye opener eye opener is is that um that even though you're serving your committee it really isn't about time because i feel like it's an hour and a half of my time a month and compared to what we do on a regular basis and I, and I felt like okay I can I can work with this and it really was like they really keep it they really manage the time well and follow the Roberts rules of order and so I felt like oh it, they're really really understanding of uh, that you're volunteering for this and that it is still your time and they're very honorable of that so those are a few things but I still I'm sure I'll still have more to learn <laughs> Well, I've had a lot of surprises. Um, I think when I first started on commissions, I was really surprised on how formal the process is, and it's even more formal on a planning commission, where you, you like, like Rachel said, you take input, you hear from staff, you hear from the community, you hear from the developer, and then you hear from interest groups, and then even in the commission, you start to discuss, and someone makes a motion in a second. And I think my so when I when I first got on the commission, it was a big learning curve of this whole process and how to make a motion and get it forward, and um, and it can be tough and it can be very time consuming. Um, I have an experience where the minimum amount of time our meetings last is about half a day, and that's an, a light meeting. It's usually, a, it can be a full day. And what I thought I'd do is to bring, um, this is not a big packet, this is a packet I would get to read um, before a meeting. But it's really, really important, um, like you're saying, when you're in the meeting, you get almost bombarded with information. And so, and you need to make a thoughtful recommendation or decision fairly quickly, and you want to serve well. And so in order to do so, that means I have to do my homework. I need to spend a weekend before the meeting reading through the packet. I go out to look at the sites. So when someone says, they just built a monster home next door, I have an idea of what that means and how it impacts them and, and what they're suffering about um, versus, well, gosh, that's not a monster home. That's, you know, they just extended the porch. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, when you get in the meeting, you get, you know, what's what's real and what's perceived. And um, the way to prepare for that is doing the homework. And it takes a lot of time. Be and I think that's important because, in my experience, even with the Parks Commission, um, I would go out, look at the parks, look at the trails that were being proposed to develop. But that's how I felt like it was important to be effective and to serve the community. And um, let's face it, um, being women, um, being a person of color, you know, I feel like sometimes we have to prove a, uh, that much more. And so reading these packets and taking the time is important. Yeah, Josh, you work for a legislator. I know that's very time consuming, especially when you're in a district. So how do you manage your time and how much time do you give to your commission? You know, obviously the planning commission, you have a lot of, of, of lead work and preparation you have to do. But contrast, like on your commission, how do you, and then talk a little about conflicts. Are there any conflicts? How do you deal with that in terms of your professional life and then your community service? Right, absolutely. Well, <clears throat> truth be told, I think it really depends on what's on the agenda, on how much to prepare. You know, fortunately, we don't have the dense reading. You know, we're not approving particular developments and such. But uh, you know, some some particular agenda items require reading or research or just you know picking up the phone and, and talking to somebody. Um, you know, it is good to at least take a look at the agenda. Again, according to the Brown Act, they have to be posted seven days prior to the meeting. So take a, a good look at the agenda. If, you know, if you have a friend who works in the city department or for, you know, a member of, you know, of, 
a council member or, or supervisor or whatever level, if you have something that can give you some good insight on what's, you know, on whatever the agenda items are, you know, give them a call that can provide you more insight. Some of it may entail you going out and taking a look at, you know, seeing it physically. Um, but again, just a lot of it is time management, you know, you know, start early so you're not there at the meeting trying to catch up, you know. Um, and then as far as conflict of interest, fortunately I work up in San Mateo County and I, I'm a San Jose resident, so there isn't any conflict there, you know. Uh, luckily my supervisor, the folks in my office are very understanding that in the event that there is a meeting or event at the same time as a commission meeting, you know, they, they would simply have somebody cover for me. They know that, you know, that we're also trying to develop ourselves as, you know, young leaders. So in that regard, you know, they're pretty understanding. So I would recommend to all of you, if you think it's going to be an issue with your, with your uh, employer, you know, make sure to bring it to their attention while you're, you're going through the process. Um, but other than that, you know, again, it, it really varies on the, the, the agenda of what the time commitment is. Um, not as much than three months, again, fortunately. <laughs> So the, the Human Relations Commission with the county is, is, is interesting because it's a little more lighthearted, if you will, than say something like the Planning Commission. And uh, we're, we're free to, to kind of make some of our own goals as well. Uh, but it can kind of break it down into to three different things. We, we will get sometimes a county supervisor that directs us to work on a task or do something. Um, there will occasionally be, there will be something going on in the community that the community is now demanding some sort of response from us. Uh, and then the third would be from the actual commissioners themselves, we can have an idea and, and do something. So I'll give, you, I'll give you some specifics. So in the Human Relations Commission we have uh, two current standing committees. We have the Justice Review Committee and the Social Equity Committee. And so uh, last year the Social Equity Committee uh, held a, uh, a vulnerable workers forum. And this was something that was directed down from a supervisor, a county supervisor. They had said, hey, uh, they were getting, I believe, complaints or people coming into their office uh, that worked in hotels, I believe, at the time. And, and, and they said, hey, I want to do a forum. I want to do a study. We want to put out a report from the county through the Human Relations Commission in regards to this. So we actually teamed up, our Social Equity Committee teamed up with the Commission on the Status of Women and held this, you know, put together this forum, got out workers, not just from uh, hotels, but from different areas, uh, and, and put together a, a report, which uh, took a whole year, and now actually, we're, this was last year, now finalizing the report to put this out and make this public, and this was something that was directed by a county supervisor, kind of for them. Uh, on the other hand, the Justice Review Committee, one thing they were working on last year, was something that was brought on by one of the commissioners. One of the commissioners saw a need uh, of, uh, uh, veterans, veterans coming back from war, coming back into the community, uh, and not having, say, the, the best resources or resources to go to school, uh, the VA hospital not, you know, kind of giving them the resources they would need, and just saw a need there for, re for, for the veterans coming back. Uh, and that was something that was completely brought on by that commissioner. And we ended up uh, joining together with the county. We, there was, there's now a veterans task force uh, that meets at, it's at the county level and there's you know big wigs that meet at, at this and there was a huge uh, veterans task force put together where there's now school programs training programs that are offered for free for them basically got the ball rolling uh, and then the commission stepped out of it and now this task force is kind of rolling with this uh, and that was something that was brought on by just by a commissioner and this was because her family was you know she had a lot of military uh, people that served the military family and brought this through. Um, and so that with ours, it's, it's, it's neat because we do get to have a, a role in different uh, different aspects of the community. I'm going to start down there, Joshua. And I want you to give a, a commercial for why <laughs> you should really give a commercial. All you think about it. Um, what's great? Why should 
How many of you serve in a private office? Any of you? Couple? Are you local or state? Local? Are you on local? Anyone state? Well, that'll change after school. <laughs> so, so a lot of people here, how many of you have applied? Couple? That's it? Okay, that'll change after tonight, too. Um, so I want you to give your commercial on why they should apply. What are, you know, everything is what's in it for me. So what's in it for them in making the decision to apply? What are they going to get out of it? We talked a lot about giving back to your community and being active in your community. That's great. But what's in it for me? What what have you personally gotten out of serving on <coughs> your appointed board of commission? Actually, you're first. <laughs> sure. Sure. Thank okay. you. <coughs> So, do you want to make a difference in your community? <laughs> do you want to become a leader? Do you want to make Santa Clara County the feminist capital of the world again? <laughs> Apply today. Plenty of commissions available. City of San Jose, County of Santa Clara, State of California. Learn more about parliamentary procedure and, and uh, Robert's, Rules of, Robert's Rules of Order. Learn more about the Brown Act. Learn about working with other people. Learn about setting agendas, chairing meetings. All these opportunities are available if you apply. Visit the uh, city clerk's website <laughs> today at www.sanjosec.gov. Click on the uh, city clerk's tab and apply today. <laughs> I think a lot of, a lot of what, we've, we mentioned, what I mentioned in my, my uh, elevator pitch, mainly just, you know, again, parliamentary procedure, running meetings, how, how you know, professional meetings are ran, uh, uh, just working with other people, setting agendas. Um, what was I getting at? And then also, again, you know, learning what the role of a commissioner is. I think a lot of people do misconstrue what, you know, the role really is. A lot of people, when I mentioned them, you know, at the time, Human Rights Commission, and you know they want me to, to do something totally different. You know they want me to, you know, they want you know at the same time they want to host event, want us to host events and such, where which we can do, but you know there's a pro, there's a formal process that has to be approved. And again, I think a lot of people really just you know they don't understand what the role is. You know, essentially, what the commissions are, they serve as a as an advisory board. So a lot of times it's frustrating because we have great ideas, but if the council, it's not even on the radar, they're not going to take the recommendation. So um, a lot of it is just being proactive and again, having, you know, just being that soundboard and really also having that, that great communication with members of the council. Let them know that, you know, what we're looking at and, you know, ask for them to kick ideas to us because if they don't kick ideas out to us, you know, then clearly it's not on the radar. So again, I think just that communication and, and just overall, just learn more, you know, grew myself into being a good governor. <laughs> Not literally a governor, but <laughs> an effective leader, how about that? <laughs> now we know what you're doing. Well, that's a really tough act to follow. I'm going <laughs> to sign up for that commission. Uh, let's see. Um, if you... If you get frustrated by government or by leaders, um, and if you want to make a difference uh, for your life and actually your family's life and your community's life, uh, you should really, really, really join a commission. And um, you would be very surprised on how much it would change you personally. That, that's what happened to me personally. Uh, and when I say it changes you personally because all of a sudden people are looking to you for answers where before I would look to others for answers I don't know if, if that makes sense but you you start to realize how much you can influence and influence for me influencing where people come into a commission and they need help Sometimes commissions are the place they go 
where they truly don't think government or people care. And so to have somebody sitting across from you and say, you know what, I, I get it, and I think we can do something, or we can try. It give, it's, I've had people approach me and say, wow, I, I came here fully not expecting anything but to just vent. <laughs> and um, that's what I have found very, very rewarding. Um, probably one of the most, for me, is um, we had a, a development that was being that was before us, and um, it, and this was a few years ago, so I don't remember all the details. But it was a large development, and it was in a it was an undeveloped area in South County, and so it was open space, beautiful area in the hills, and the developer did everything right by the book. But then um, two people came in. Um, I remember there were two older men, and they said. <coughs> you know, this was an ancient Indian burial ground and we wanted to go on site to see if we could, um, if they, if it was a, because it was a burial ground, we just wanted to do a, um, a religious ceremony. And they didn't let us. And that really bothered me. And so I said to, during the process, um, I said, well, why didn't you let them go on site? And they said, well, we didn't have to. We followed CEQA. We follow the county's regulations, and we did what we needed to do. That's not a requirement. And right then and there, I said to myself, they legally have the right to develop, but I don't think that this is right. And so that's, and I, and sometimes when taking a recommendation, you usually try and work with your commissioners, but this time I said, Marianne, you're out on your own, and it's okay. And so I said, you know, I, I really feel like the outreach and the um, community involvement was lacking, and so I really think that they really need to come back to us, and so I'm not going to vote for this. And I was shocked, really, really shocked, because like I said, a lot of our commissioners and developers were there, like, let's, this is open space, let's develop. But they said, you know what, these people, they agreed, these people should have been treated with respect. And that's when the next day, um, the gentleman called me, on the phone, and he said, I just want to let you know that I didn't think anybody would listen. So that's the difference you can make. That's amazing. <laughs> She's amazing. I'm going to honor her. <laughs> um, oftentimes, we complain about not being heard and that no one listens to us. And if we want to be heard as um, the younger generation or as the minority generation or as women, then we need to be active and we need to make our voices be heard. And um, I, I feel like what I get out of it is I get to meet some amazing people and some amazing colleagues that are now um, really great friends of mine and, and people that I can lean on and people I can bounce advice off of both personally and professionally. And that's what you get out of it. So you get this great network of colleagues and people who are like-minded and um, while at the same time giving back. So it's definitely a benefit. And uh, I'll, I'll also take it back, kind of like uh, Josh did, to what I said in the beginning, which is it, it goes back to that that serving your community. And if you're sitting here tonight, and you're interested in you know learning about these, you obviously have that aspect of you already on wanting to serve or wanting to give back. And so what I can leave you with is that serving on a commissioner board it actually does make a difference, uh, and you can actually make a difference. And so it's not just, you know, okay, well, what, are we, was our voice really heard? Uh, does it really matter? Um, you know, in, 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 a, in an example to highlight it, uh, when the, the death penalty uh, was coming up for, for a vote, um, the, one of the, the supervisors had asked the Human Relations Commission, the Justice, our Justice Review Committee, to compile a study, to figure it out, and to give a recommendation to the board, the, the Santa Clara County you know, Board of uh, Supervisors. And we came back with a recommendation that they 
you know, accepted, and they went forward with based on our work, uh, and it was it was to revoke the death penalty, which ended up not passing. But um, but here in Santa Clara County, it would have, um, and and that was you know work that we put in that actually made a difference at the county level, that then made a difference you know with, with beyond that, uh, and so it does you know serving on these boards or commissions really, really does make a difference. Uh, and believe it or not, I was naive enough. I didn't know that California had boards or commissions to walk till, till this event. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know that there were, there were boards or commissions that paid. Um, and so I will be one of the people that apply, not for the money, but um, <laughs> that I will be applying for a California board or commission, um, you know, because I think in that same, you know, area, serving your city, serving your county, serving your state, uh, beings that I've served and I know that it really does make a difference. You don't just, you know, the community doesn't just win, you don't just win personally, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, like Christina was saying, the friends you meet, um, so I, you know, I will be one myself and I hope everybody here uh, finds something, grab the list, like the county list that's over there, you know, find something that resonates with you at the state level, the city level, uh, and apply, because uh, like you were saying, you know, that's the, that's the really only the rule. And then, you know, you got to apply. So. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for your service, too, to your community and for being here and sharing your, your insight. I think that um, I found it fascinating, so I appreciate you being here. So I had the pleasure of introducing uh, Mary Hernandez, who's here with us. Um, she is a Deputy Appointment Secretary for Governor Brown. Um, you know, we're very fortunate because we were commenting and there's two lists right here, they're the same list, and they are the vacancy list that the Governor's Office has right now. Maybe you can just pass them around, people can look at it. If you go to the California Women Lead website, we have that list on our website, so you can go home and you can print it and you can look at it and that type of thing. But I was commenting earlier, this is the shortest list I've seen in, in a really long time um, because I know that Mary and the deputies and, and the appointment secretary, Mona Pascal, are working very hard to fill these vacancies. And I know that this governor is very passionate about public service, and I know Mary will talk a little bit about his philosophy, but. Um, you know, way back when, when he was first governor, uh, that's when California Women Lead, at that time CWAR was founded. And we started by, actually no joke, we were the original binders full of women. And we actually gave, I have the photo, I do, uh, we gave the governor, not me, but the founders, um, a binder because at that time, there were no women who had ever served in a cabinet level position. And he was the first governor to ever appoint women to his cabinet. And he was also the governor who brought, as I mentioned before, the public member to many of these boards and commissions because he realized how important it is to have folks to represent the diverse mosaic of California. And so we worked very hard at California Women League to help the appointment staff because we know that you could not have right now better advocates. This is my third administration that I've worked with. Three? Yeah, three. And you could not have better advocates. If there is a time to apply at the state level, now is it. And I'm just thrilled Mary's here to join us, and I'm going to turn it over to her because she will, she's an expert. So, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, the website. Um, thanks so much for having me here tonight. It's, it was really great to uh, get the experience, the personal experience from some folks who are currently serving in appointed positions uh, here locally uh, to hear how, what was their entry point, uh, what are their stories, what drove them to do it, how are they enjoying it, you know, where, what do they think it's going to uh, take up, where is it going to take them next. All those types of, of stories and shared experience are, are, are important. For us to hear. Uh, I remember as a kid because um, I'm just like you. I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a kid from Chula Vista uh, who grew up uh, with two working class uh, parents who, uh, who imagined, uh, who thought 
what it was that I could do because I had parents who told me that I could do things that I wanted to do if I focused and I worked hard. Um, I remember as a kid growing up in our working class neighborhood, I thought, um, wow, politics. For some reason, it was something that always interested me. Um, and I thought that that's something that people like the Kennedys and you know all these other high highbrow names took part in. And as I got older and I got involved and I started becoming more of an organizer, more of an advocate, I said, wait a minute, it's not only for the Kennedys, it's for the Hernandezes, it's for the Perezes, it's, 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 for, the, it's for everybody else, it's for everybody. Uh, we just need to unlock the, uh, see, I feel bad because of this pillar here, this Rodney Dangerfield thing, that some folks at some point are gonna, like, I'm gonna hide behind it. But, uh, but there's, there's, um, there's an important role for all of us in our communities to be able to engage. Uh, a few of the things that uh, I heard folks say is we want to be sure to have a voice, a representation, a seat at the table. That's kind of a common cliche. Well, I want to sit at the table in order to be able to have a voice. I remember when I got my sea legs, um, I grew up in San Diego, so I got my sea legs in Nevada because uh, I went to school out there. I've got a, uh, uh, my undergraduate and graduate degrees in political science and my a uh, professor happened to be a state senator, uh, and I was in her class, and she said, hey, will you stay? I know you're graduating, maybe moving back to California, but will you stay just for the summer and work with me on some campaigns? And uh, I said, I said, sure. And I remember um, working with her, and eight years later, I, I'd still, uh, I was still out there working uh, in, in that community, uh, gaining a lot of experience and a lot of connections. Uh, and uh, that was really invaluable in, in a smaller state like Nevada. <clears throat> but I remember a lot of the rooms that I would walk into, not only would I be the only woman in that room, not only be, I'd be the only person of color. Uh, and I said to myself, gosh, you know, um, I can never, I can't leave this room because if I do, then nobody will be there. We won't be represented. And uh, eventually, you, you've got to be able to, um, to harness the passion inside of you in order to change the landscape, in order to do things to create pathways for people behind you. I'm getting to the age right now where um, you know, I, I, I was a rebel rouser uh, in my 20s and, and really kind of going out there saying, I can, let's change the world, let's, let's do all these things, you know, let's make a better place. And, um, and, and then as I started to get older and started to kind of um, gain more responsibility and more experiences and work in collaboration with more people, I started realizing, wait a minute, uh, we're looking at a, a new generation of folks that, uh, that, um, that I now feel a, a bit of a responsibility to help lift up. Nobody in this room got here to where they're at alone. There was somebody in everybody's life who helped them get to where they are, whether it was a teacher, a parent, a mentor, a friend. Um, somebody helped, helped us believe in ourselves in order to be able to achieve. And I think that there's, there's a responsibility that we have, especially as women and women of color, uh, even guys back there, to, uh, to help people uh, lift themselves up as well. But it starts with um, gaining the experience and the exposure on, uh, on giving back and doing things. And, and uh, one of the things I do love about my job, I'm an appointee uh, in my position in the governor's office, is that I get to meet great people who are subject matter expertise, experts who um, have credentials um, just uh, that are so humbling to me um, and harness their passions into a role where they get to nourish that. Um, one of the recent uh, boards that, that I worked on was Fair Employment and Housing. Uh, the governor reorganized that uh, commission into a council and so there was this new um, new day that started. I think they had their first meeting back in June. Um, but talking with folks in employment and housing, the basic essentials that we need to survive, and all the things that they had accomplished in and have wanted to do, uh, and out of all of California, there are seven, seven, council, uh, seven people on that council, and there were hundreds of applications in, and a lot of folks who, had, who were very passionate about it, and one of the one of the things I thought about as folks were, were talking here about some of their local contributions is one of the uh, one of the women on the board 
um, um, uh, Shanae Miner, she comes out of Alameda, but she served on her local rent stabilization board and uh, eventually went to go work for the city of Berkeley, where she currently is. But um, as part of fair employment and housing, a portion of their work is in, in, in housing discrimination. And so um, as a housing uh, expert, um, uh, look to her to provide insights and guidance in her, ex in her subject matter uh, expertise. But it started because she served on her local rent stabilization board in uh, Alameda. Um, and so when we, we talk about, um, um, you know, where's the entry point? Uh, is it at a local level, county level, state level, whatever it happens to be? It could be anywhere, but it always helps to have that connection and that, that service in order to say, this is why I'm qualified, this is what I've been doing, and this is why I want to continue to do it at, 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 a, at a higher level um, uh, with the state. <coughs> so, um, so there are a lot of, um, uh, of reasons why it's important to, uh, to, to nourish the passion inside of us, to uh, go online and, and to apply. Um, and what I would like to, and a lot of us just don't know where to start. A lot of us don't know where to begin. Um, and uh, with, with great groups um, uh, uh, like we have here tonight, and, and, and Rachel has, we've worked with them a lot on going to a lot of different groups um, uh, like yours in order to be able to have these conversations and give folks a little bit of an awareness around the entry point. So, okay, I'm going to talk forever, so let me just start with the process. So the process for application for the state is much like those on the local level. The local level, there's an application. So you just go to the governor's website, gov.ca.gov. <coughs> there's an applications tab up at the top. I'm sorry, appointments tab up at the top, and then you just select that. Should we go? And you just select that, and it takes you to this magnificently outdated <laughs> application form. The appointments program is what we help manage, and one of the great things about Jerry Brown is, um, is um, at the beginning, Rachel talked about our goal of 51% women in appointed positions. This governor, you talked a little bit about the governor's history and connection to thinking differently than the way other people had thought previously. 47% of his appointees are women. You know, we're working towards that goal, but 47% is a pretty good number. Um, uh, you know, uh, in his administration, serving in uh, in uh, in various roles, uh, uh, cabinet members with regard to his his uh, his cabinet, Diana Dooley, who's the head of Health and Human Services, um, who actually served in the first administration as well, um, uh, is is joining him now. Mona Pascal, who is my boss. Um, is uh, in his cabinet as his appointment secretary. Uh, Dana Williamson is now the cabinet secretary in external uh, affairs, and, and uh, 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 Nancy McFadden, who is kind of like his uh, his his uh, chief of staff. She's his his uh, I think his senior advisor. Um, uh, but he he Saran Ana Monsanto's uh, finance director um, has, has been serving him. It, it, you know, there, there are um, a lot of women in a lot of very high level positions uh, within the governor's uh, administration. Um, and, and you also talked a little bit about his commitment to having a public voice um, on, on the um, on that list that's going around, one, one of the great things about this governor is he does understand that. So when you're talking about the board of, of, of nursing, it's not just the nursing industry, the hospitals and the practitioners and so forth that are represented on the board, the consumers um, are represented on the board in the form of the public members. So a lot of those DCA boards uh, that license whatever area of, uh, a profession it happens to do. There are also public members on uh, a lot of those, um, a lot of those uh, specialty boards. So, <clears throat> back to the application. When you go to the website, you hit the appointments tab, and then you'll come up with the online application, and you just go through and you uh, you fill it out. Um, I think it's tab number four or five. <coughs> oh, three. Neither four. Four. Top, tab number three. Um, it'll list all the various appointments that, uh, that are available. Now the one thing to know about this tab right here is that just because it's represented on the pull down doesn't necessarily mean that it's available. And uh, uh, because it, what this does is it just lists all of them that where you have an, an, an interest 
an area you have an interest in. The vacancy list that you have uh, circulated that I think is also on the Women Lead uh, website, right, um, is the current one about the, the vacancies that, that exist. Now one caveat we need to remember is that no two boards are governed by the same set of rules. Uh, so uh, a public member on one board may mean something differently on another board. Uh, so when you see a public member, it, it, you know, you, it would be good to connect with the deputy who has that particular board or commission in their portfolio in order to find out a little bit more about the background in the seat um, and what they're looking for. Um, I think it was Marianne who mentioned that on the planning commission, not only do they look for um, um, uh, a diversity of representation uh, that happens in, in a lot of the boards and commissions that we had to like you don't want all developers you don't want all environmentalists you have to have contributions from our, from all the different interests in order to be able to have thoughtful conversations uh, to come out with good uh, good decisions um, and recommendations for the council or the board of supervisors I'm not sure. um, and so there are a lot of the different criteria that govern um, how do we look at who's going to fill this vacancy. You know, uh, the governor has been very committed to having uh, boards and commissions reflect the population and that of California. Um, uh, and, and so there's the vast region that is California. There's the, um, all the, the ethnicities, the cultures, the, you know, well, the genders that are represented, that um, all those different um, factors weigh into uh, some of the vetting in the process that we go through, but and, and one thing that I want to put out there right now I forget which uh, panelist had mentioned that uh, the timing of appointments isn't exactly It's not exact and nor is it quick um, So there it does require a lot of patience. I had somebody call a little, a little while ago I said hey, I filled out my application two weeks ago, and I haven't heard from you <laughs> well Thank you for calling. And um, and uh, you know, two weeks is you know, we there are a lot of boards and a lot of commissions and a lot of things that are happening at any given time. And you know, we're trying to do the best we can to manage this among the thousands of applicants. But but it's always good to um, to follow up with the deputy because then what it does is, is it, it draws a, a bit of attention to your application in order to be able to take a look at it. Um, and there are different ways that applicants come to us. So um, a lot of them through um, through. Uh, reach uh, outreach efforts efforts like this uh, some of them are people who just randomly apply where we're looking through okay who's applied and let's look through some of the applications that have come in um, there are people who will recommend people saying hey you know I know this great um, uh, fire marshal who would be good on the building standards commission and so we'll call that great fire marshal and say hey have you ever thought about applying so there are different tactics to use to try and generate interest in uh, in applications for the boards and commissions uh, that the governor has appointments to. Okay, back to the application. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm avoiding this like the plague, aren't I? So, um, so, the, so under the position, there are, there are various ones that you can choose. It doesn't necessarily represent that there's a position there, but it does show some areas of interest, so that way we get an idea of what you're interested in doing. Um, one of the little particular um, Oh, things that bugs me about this application is that when you go through your work history you've got to first of all you can't save it and go back so once you start it you got to finish it uh, the second thing is uh, when you go through your employment history um, it does ask for a month a date and a year and sometimes when you're going back to 1982 you can't exactly remember which date exactly you started that job this isn't a catch-22 we're not trying to say oh well you didn't start on the third year or records indicate you started on 28th um, it's just to give us a general time frame of when you start but the application does have you uh, put in a month date, and a year and if you don't do that then it rejects it and um, you know, could I don't know. You could lose it and then have to start all over again. So it, it's it's a little bit sensitive. Um, but you just go through, and I think most people are familiar with online forms, um, and uh, fill it out, and you hit submit, and you sign the authorization form, and you send that in to us, and um, then your application goes on file. And then I imagine maybe a the phone call to the deputy. I think also on the Women Lead website you have the deputy assignments. <coughs> so. Okay. The way that, that our work is assigned is, now I'm going to go to this side of the room because I feel bad for you all right in here. Um, uh, the, the way that this works is um, there are uh, four deputies 
let's see, Sarah, Sonia, myself, and Michael, three out of four women, uh, and then uh, Patrick, who's our chief deputy, and Nettie, who's a senior advisor, and of course Mona. So there are, everybody has an assignment uh, or a portfolio of boards and commissions and departments. Um, so on the Women Lead website, it'll show you uh, which deputy handles what board. So that way, you, in their contact information, you can get a hold of them to say, hey, I, you know, I applied for, let's just say, Building Standards Commission, and uh, which is in my portfolio and that I'm currently working on. Um, uh, you know, have, did you receive my application? And you know, what's the process? And what does it look like? What's the timeline? You can ask questions and so forth. So, but that that um, contact sheet is is a really good tool to use because it gives you a connection and contact information right into the deputy who handles and manages that particular uh, appointment. Um, let's see, I talked about timeline, talked a little bit about the application, um, the criteria. Some, <coughs> some of the appointments do require Senate confirmation. Do folks, on, do you know what Senate confirmation means? You get grilled by the rules committee. <laughs> yeah. you, have you watched the Senate confirmation hearings? Have you heard about it? Or do you just remember uh, all the Supreme Court things that are happening? Yeah, what was his name again? Thomas or something? Thomas. What was his name? Clarence Thomas. But yeah, and, and a lot of them. John Kerry just went through Senate confirmation. But there's also a similar process here in our state where um, there are certain boards and commissions um, that do require uh, the Senate to confirm. And uh, so you'll go through a rules committee hearing and then it goes to the floor for a vote. Um, and it's a uh, you know, it's a time. It's an opportunity for the Senate to give its input on some of the boards that, uh, on some of the appointees that the governor selects. And there have been instances where people have um, have been, um, you know, not confirmed. Um, uh, so, and then some of the boards are paid, some of them are not. Uh, you know, most of them provide, uh, you know, travel and per diem uh, reimbursements. Um, but like I said, each board and commission has its own set of rules. So uh, if you want to know specifically the details, it's best to just get a hold of the deputy that's in charge. Um, do folks have any questions? A single question? Yay! You know, I would say, um, I would say it, it, it depends on, um, you know, on, on, on the, the relevance of the work experience. Um, like for me, um, I go back into, I don't think, uh, when I really hit this, my stride in my career, which was around 90, I don't know, 94 or something like that, um, you know, all the things I did at, at, as the, I sold tickets at the MWR department at the submarine base in San Diego. I don't include that. I don't include my UPS delivery days um, kind of a thing. Um, so it, it really depends upon um, you know the relevance to you know to, to your career was it something that what you were doing while you were you know um, working your way towards your career so it, it, 20 years is you know but there's no real set rule on how far to go back a volunteer there's a there's a, a section for community involvement so um, and other memberships so to speak so uh, if you scroll through the application, you'll see, you know, you've got the professional experience and community involvement, uh, memberships that you may have uh, of organizations that you belong to. Uh, I think there's even uh, a section where if you just wanted to add a little bit of information, you could. Um, uh, it, also, at the end, there's a, there's a section for you to explain why it is you would like to serve and, um, and uh, how you would make a difference. Yes. Well, it depends. <laughs> I'm going to say that a lot of the, the, to the questions that you have. It depends. Um, some of uh, uh, some of the the boards and commissions will meet throughout the state. You got to remember, this is a state board, so it's important that uh, there are opportunities that there are public meetings all uh, all around the state. Some of them, uh, for financial reasons, stay in Sacramento because they have an office there and, and they use uh, space and. Um, and, and maybe the staff is all in Sacramento, so instead of flying all the staff to, I don't know, some, you know, having them commute to Oakland and paying for reimbursements or something, 
you know, it's easier just to bring in the commissioners than to, to travel like that. So, but it, it just depends upon the board and commission and what their meeting schedule is like in the calendar. Yes? Um, when you're filling out in the application process, and, uh, is it better to be like focused towards uh, one thing or to be more diverse about your experience and uh, what your interests? Yeah, I would say I would say share what what your interests are. I mean, there there are, are times uh, when 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 I was uh, reviewing the applications for fair employment and housing, there was a gentleman in Sacramento who was a criminal defense attorney, and uh, he had applied, and he came in and and I had a great conversation with him, and I thought you know. Um, uh, this 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 gentleman is very very well qualified. He's 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 committed. Um, he uh, he seems like he's he would be engaged. Like he would be a good um, uh, a good member of any commission. What what um, uh, he ended up actually getting appointed to was the uh, security guard, uh, the private security guard disciplinary review uh, 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 committee. So. If you, you got to remember that as as deputies, when we meet somebody who um, has great qualities and we feel would be a good um, contributor for um, uh, any board or commission, um, we don't look at the at at uh, individuals in a box. You know, um, what we try to do is is think more broadly about well, what more? Um, what what are we working on right now? Where is the need? And is there a good match for this person? If not, maybe for this board, maybe there's another opportunity and a different one. Um, and, and so we'll we'll try and think outside the box. And it does help to understand a little bit more about you know passions, interests, experience, and, and things like that. And and also when you're looking at the list, don't just look at the list in terms of your professional. Rachel told her story earlier about how she even got interested in in the board that she's on right now. You know, had no clue about security guards and what the what the board did, but ended up finding a, finding a real connection and um, uh, and, and and purpose in, in, in service on that board. Uh, you know, the, one of the great things about all these boards, they're all so doggone important. You know, you, you won't you don't know that the, the security guard uh, disciplinary review uh, board exists, but thank God that there are people there doing that work. Um, because these are the people who are watching after us um, in a lot of the public places that we go, and uh, it, it's great to know that there are people looking at this. And there's all—it's also great to know that there are people who are willing to take a second look at people who've been denied. Um, because a lot of times, uh, you, you probably know in the private security guard industry, it's—it's it's not a high wage job, and and um, you know they, they, they probably make a, a pretty good living, but but it's not like they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, and a lot of times there could be people who may have been denied because of I don't know they were down on their luck or something unfortunate happened and how long do you have to, I mean I made mistakes every we're human I made mistakes um, you know throughout my college years name it I probably did it and and I remember my professor once told me she said how long do you have to keep paying for that F that you had in that class back in 1987 you know um, and I and I. And so it's also about people who would be thoughtful about what are the circumstances, how long ago, and what have you done to correct the, those behaviors afterwards. But you know, thank goodness that there are people doing that um, to be able to do that. So you never would have thought that that was something that existed until, you know, perhaps just tonight. You know, and and it's like that for the guide dogs for the blind. You know, it's not all the fairs that are around uh, the state, the county fairs. I grew up going. We didn't go to a lot of things when we were little. We didn't have a lot of money. Went to Magic Mountain. We went to Knott's Berry Farm, and we go to the fair. Um, uh, but it was something that I remember as a kid doing a lot, and it was important to me. And it would be cool to, you know, do something like that as well. Sorry. Question. Okay. Yes. So I'm listening to you and why people should might want to do it. I ask myself, who created these commissions? For what purpose did they become uh, part of the system? And whose system is it? Is it a government elected government system? Or what are these boards' functions, as many as they are? And who knows what board, commissions, committees should exist? 
Well, I think that's more of a policy question. Uh, and there have been a few governors who have been asking that same question uh, over the last uh, you know, few years or so is um, what's the relevance of the commission? What does it do today? Why was it created? Is it still necessary? But that's more of a policy question and not necessarily one uh, for me to answer. What I can say is, is um, that with regard to the creation of some commissions, this governor did create some of these commissions. And if it wasn't this governor, it, you know, maybe it might have been his father. Um, uh, Fair Employment and Housing is one example. Um, it was a, I remember, because uh, um, we'll, go, we'll have conversations with the governor on our recommendations for, for him to consider um, on who it is that he, he would like to appoint. And uh, there'll be times where he'll ask us, well, what is this commission here for? And, and just exactly the questions you're asking, and I think a lot of times he's looking to see if we've done our homework, to see if, um, if uh, you know, the folks that we're talking about, that, uh, that we truly understand what their connection is to the particular board or commission that, uh, that we're talking about. This governor gets engaged in these conversations. Um, I haven't talked with other governors about this, but as I, as I understand, like, like um, you know, it's unprecedented in terms of his engagement on, on a lot of the boards and commissions. A lot of times he will pick up the phone and he will call the, uh, the applicants to have the conversation because he cares a lot about, um, about the work that's done on these commissions uh, and, and the connection that it has to individual lives. Um, and uh, and so, the, the question on whether a border commission exists is not one for me to answer right now. Um, uh, but it but it's 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 a question that's been talked about before. And, and all I can say is that this governor um, gets engaged in all of all of his appointments and um, and ask, has asked those questions before. So do these boards impact the budget that is decided? Um, well, the board, the boards are charged. Whatever the, I mean, every board has a different mission. Every board has a different purpose. So uh, there's not really one answer to that question. And, and the second thing is, they don't do the budget. Uh, well, actually, some of them have conversations. Like, let's say the community board does have a discussion with the chancellor about some of the budget proposals that the chancellor's office then works with the legislature, but it's the legislature and it's the governor who decides on the budgets through their process that they have. So it's not it's not necessarily um, you know something that uh, that each board and, and each commission deals with. So that's 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 kind of um, more of a I guess a budgetary question, not necessarily an appointments question. Is that clarify clears my <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, I think that um, everything's done on a case by case basis. There, there are some instances where um, we've had people who live out of state apply, um, and um, you know, if it's a California Board of Commission, generally you probably want people from California do, uh, doing that work. Uh, there is a government code section that guides a lot of the work that we do that says uh, that at time of appointment you have to be a resident of, of the state. Um, or you have to reside in California, uh, and, but there's also an interpretation that says that non-decision-making um, boards can have out-of-state people. So it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis on which board it is you're talking about, what rules govern it, and who the applicant is. Because the first uh, qualification is, you know, are you qualified? You know, and then you go through the little checklist, and then what type of person are you looking for? What's the seed? And so on and so forth. <laughs> I think that, again, everything's done on a case-by-case -case basis, but if you work for a legislator, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I would say focus on your, your, your uh, you know, it, it, unless you're looking for, like, a full-time staff position or something like that. You know, if it's a full-time staff position and, and uh, you're interested in, like, I don't know, what do you do? Who do you work for? Okay, Wachowski. And as a field representative in his district office? Yeah, and so like I don't know if you have a subject matter expertise in I don't know business and uh, you apply for some position over at GoBiz or something like that. I, I it, it it just depends because there are paid appointments and there are non-paid appointments, um, and uh, uh, so it would just depends if you're looking for a staff position or not. Cool. Yes.
You know, that's a new, that's a relatively new option that uh, they just updated. What we did is, you know, because um, the application, we get feedback from a lot of people, including each other, about the application itself. And uh, so the programmers went through and retooled it based on the feedback that we provided him on the system. And uh, one of the things that it changed was that ability to waive the per diem. It has no bearing with regard to consideration. It's just something that some people, um, you know, choose to do is is to waive the per diem and in the uh, you know, what is it reimbursement or something like that salary and waive the per diem and salary. If, if when we meet good people, we want to put them in good places, and um, uh, we if what we try to not do is to be um, uh, to, to work in kind of like columns and silos, and, and we want to be able to think more broadly about wow, this person's really fabulous. You know, it would be great to get uh, to um, to maybe have a conversation about you know a different opportunity where it's it's you know we're we're looking for. I don't know, public members or good members for right now. So um, yeah, it, 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 the board or the appointment, the position that you apply for may or, 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 or may not be um, a good match, um, but perhaps there's another opportunity uh, in, you know, on a different board or commission. So uh, we never try and kind of, and close the door uh, just because maybe you know if you're looking for I don't know the veterinary board or something like that and there isn't a position because of I don't know certain criteria that are needed for the the vacancy maybe there's an opportunity as a public member in, in a different um, place. Um, there was a question about listing where you lived for the last uh, five years. My question is similar to hers. If you were out of the country for three out of the five, last five years, would they automatically disqualify you? No, no. That's I. I don't think the the. I don't know. I didn't put that question on the application, but uh, it's it's never been used, as far as I know, as kind of a um, disqualifier for uh, consideration. Um, I you know maybe it's there to ensure you know sure that. If I don't know, Mary Hernandez, pretty common, right? Um, that that you can determine which Mary Hernandez in the whole wide world it is. I gotta tell you a little story. So I was going to school out in Las Vegas, and my roommate. I went home one weekend, and my roommate. Um, I got back. He said, "Yeah, um, something happened, and I tried to call your parents' house. So I looked up in the phone book, Mary Hernandez in Chula Vista, and I couldn't find you." Uh, <laughs> you know, but um, I, you know, it, it could be just kind of an identifier to you know, uh, you know, differentiate between this Mary Hernandez and that Mary Hernandez. But it's never been used, as far as I know, as anything that's going to disqualify people. Yes, sir. I might have missed this, but um, just out of curiosity, you mentioned that forty. 7% of the governor's appointees are women. Is that 47% of the total or those who he has appointed? 47% uh, of the governor's appointees. So um, it's my understanding that they're brown appointees. So those are the ones that he's in has his appointed. administration. So is that different than the total number? Yeah, oh, that's a good, I, I didn't, I haven't like dissected it and cross-tapped it. Uh, so, um, but I, but I do know I did ask the question: How many, uh, how many of the governor's appointments are are women in this forty five percent? It's pretty pretty high number. Is it me? Sorry, I must be playing with the cord too much. Um, are there any other questions? Yes. I would, you know, I, I think that's a personal choice to, to figure out, you know, what, what's my pathway to, to, to uh, getting involved and giving back? You know, do you want to cast a broad net? Do you want to um, become a little bit more 
um, specialized to be able to build a foundation to say, here's all the great things that I've done, and um, I'd like to continue to do that on, on, a, on a state level. Um, I think it's a personal uh, choice for you to be able to decide for it. But I mean, there, there are people who, um, who applied, uh, you know, who, who, who don't have local uh, appointed positions, but it's, it's all about finding your niche, finding what's important to you, and nourishing the passion to, to give back. That, um, uh, that that folks talked about earlier was how much time it's going to consume, and um, and uh, you know the, the the three things that we ask I don't know if it's three, but things that we ask for appointees is a you show up, um, b that you get engaged and be an active participant, and uh, c you do your homework. Uh, in preparation for participation at uh, whatever public meetings they happen to be. Um, the time commitment, please be sure that you understand fully the time commitment of a particular board that you're seeking appointment to um, so that you understand, I got to be in Sacramento two days a month um, uh, plus do homework and you know and, and I'm a, you know I've got a dog and a husband and a kid and you know, um, you know, I, I don't have that kind of time. So please be sure when you're talking to the deputy that you have a full understanding of what the time commitment is. And, and there is no contribution <laughs> that you've got to make towards it in order uh, to, to, uh, to serve. There, there's citizenship is one of the um, yeah uh, are you a, a U.S. citizen? I think. It asks if you are a citizen. That's true. But it says if no, please identify the country. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you you can be a a, a non-resident or a what is, what is a resident um, in order to be eligible. But that's a good question. I've never been asked that question before. I'll follow up and find out. Yeah, uh, you know, so, uh, there are there are different types of boards and commissions. Some are regional boards, like the district ag associations. There's, I think, one per DAA, and so there are I don't know how many of them, 50 or something like that. There's a ton of them, so those are all for that region. Um, and then there are the statewide ones, like fair employment and housing. Um, it's it's great to get geographic representation. It's great to get gender balance. It's great to get a, you know ethnic and cultural balance. Uh, great to get uh, you know expertise and experience balance. And so there are a lot of different um, things that you're looking at when you're looking at what should this board look like. Um, uh, but there's not no one single factor that unless it's specified in statute that qualifies you know um, one criteria or another. Unless, and like I said, every boarding commission has different guidelines and statutory requirements. Uh, so that's why it's best to check with the deputy to see what's going on. But yeah, region, regional balance is always something that, uh, that is good to have. We appreciate that. Yes? And in terms of the time commitment, are there boards that meet on weekends or are they mostly during the and they're mostly during the week, but it would just be determined. I, I don't think I've seen one on the weekend. There could be subcommittee meetings that meet, but I think that the board might determine their own um, uh, timelines and cal calendar. Uh, so I, I don't remember seeing one that met on weekends, um, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't happen. But generally, that I've seen the meetings happen during the week. Yes, sir. I think I'm missing the process a little bit because there are lots of positions. How do you figure out where the openings are? And secondly, when you apply for those positions, the background obviously have to align with those uh, descriptions. Well, so um, on the Women Lead uh, website, uh, there is that uh, sheet that was passed around that shows the vacancy. It's the vacancy list that, that we have right now. 
Uh, so you'll have to do a little cross-referencing to see you know, what's available. And you also need to remember that a lot of these run on, uh, terms run on cycles. So if you apply in uh, February and there isn't a vacancy, if maybe a term might end in June. And so uh, maybe the, uh, a, a position will open up at, you know, later on. So um, you know, a lot of them run on cycles. Um, so the vacancy list is ever changing. I don't think you, you should be you know, uh, stopped from applying for something just because it's not on the vacancy list. The basic vacancy list gives you an idea of what are current, currently exists. Right? And you asked about whether there needs to be a connection. I think I think it just I think it depends. Like um, like we talked about earlier, the um, uh, the Board of Registered Nursing has different um, different uh, different slots that are that are on the board. Some of them are licensees, and some of them could be industry. Some of them are the public. So obviously, if you're a public member, you're not going to have a background necessarily in healthcare. You know, maybe um, maybe you. Uh, had an experience with um, maybe you have a, a, a child who has a chronic disease who where you're co a constant user of it and so it led you to this advocacy path you know path or something like that so even though you're not licensed in the medical field you understand it in the systems and then what the public faces in trying to gain access and stuff so you know that's that's kind of some experience but um, but if you're uh, applying for a position Let's say UI appeals, which it's on the list, but the governor's actually not filling those uh, at, 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 the, at, at the moment. We're not looking at them right now, but there does exist a vacancy. I think you have to be an attorney in order to uh, uh, be considered for, for that particular slot. So again, it's best to connect with the deputy whose portfolio that the Board of Commission is in in order to get the details uh, and background around any particular slot specifically. Okay. Yes? Once it's submitted, it will be there until the end of uh, the governor's, uh, the Brown administration. Uh, we keep them all on file. There are applications that have been in there since, I don't know, 2000, beginning of 2011 or whenever the system opened up. Um, so they remain in the system. I've answered all the questions. Oh. <laughs> How many? How many positions would you apply? You know what? It used to be that you could only apply for like three. Now I think it's endless, but I don't think you want to do that because you don't want to apply for all the positions. I would be like, oh my God, look at all these. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, w I would just pick a few, you know, whatever interests you, but it, you're actually not limited anymore. That's another thing that changed. You can like put a whole bunch of them on there. And look, Rachel's going to do it. Yeah, you used to be limited, but now it's limitless. Um, but uh, that doesn't, I don't want to encourage anybody to do that. But it's up to you. So, can the just give out appointments for us to have a 15 minute chat to try to figure out you know, what are the openings and things like that? And is it possible to set up a conference call? Yeah, I mean, I, what, what you could do is just find out the deputy who's in charge, say, hey, listen, uh, you know, I, I applied for a position, and, you know, is, are, you know, are you currently working on that board? Um, you know, is, my, uh, is, is it something to where you're looking at in the near term? If not this in the near term, what are you working on? Is there another connection that you can possibly consider me for? Um, you know, maybe if you, uh, you know if you wanted to do a general interest, um, you know, interview or something like that, uh, just have a conversation with the deputy because I think every deputy manages their portfolio, um, you know, a, a little bit differently. Um, but just you know, call the deputy and they can check it out. Okay. Yes. Um, since you said that the application stays there on record, if you weren't selected for that particular year, can you re do you go through the same process again the next year, or is the application there and you just need to? So let's say that you applied in 2011 for some, I don't know, something, and uh, nothing ever, uh, you know, there wasn't a good match that came of that. And then in 2000, I don't know, say that right now you're, you're interested in doing that. You can call and say, um, you have my application on file. I'd like to amend it to include an interest in this particular board. So you can always send in addendums. Or, you know, if you wanted to, um, you know, I've seen people reapply 
for, for things. That's but it'll you know it'll just show up that you've applied twice kind of thing. Um, but if you wanted to connect to say you know here's some updated information, here's updated areas that I'm interested in, and you know I'd like to revisit my application and let me know what it is that you need from me. Question: So you lock this database so we can't go back. Once it's submitted, once it's submitted, once it's submitted you can't um, uh, access it again to, I don't know, to update it. What you do is just connect with us personally um, and, and we'll work with you to you know, update any information that you have. Okay. Now I've answered all the questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. that every person that I've dealt with um, in the appointment staff, they're, they're all phenomenal. And so you really can call them, you know, they may be at a busy time, but they'll get back to you or you can email them. Um, and they really do want, their, their job is to find good people to bring before the governor. And so they really are great to work with. Um, I do agree too that you know once you fill this out, you do kind of hit submit and it goes off into the great yeah. you know beyond and you wonder what, where is it? It's circling around somewhere. But you know really do communicate with them. Maybe not like every day or every week, <laughs> you know. But um, but really follow up because I do think that you're applying for a position. You know you're applying and and the other piece of advice I give is be courteous. I've seen some people be pretty rude to members of the, the appointment staff, and you know, it's not really going to get you very far. And so be respectful that they've got a lot of boards and commissions that they have to fill. They really are trying to find the best and the brightest that they can. They, they know that you're qualified to do it, and they do want to work with you to find a, a good fit. Um, and then the last thing is on the time commitment. I will tell you on my commission, a um, couple things that I'll give you from an appointee's perspective is um, you can Google a lot of these boards and commissions. A lot of them have websites. And so you can Google them. Some of the bigger ones, like the medical board or the nursing board, you can read the minutes. You can see the agenda items. You can really get a sense of the different issues and how much time it takes. I think some of the bigger ones, they meet for three days. Um, in addition to being on other some committees that you have to participate in. So you really want to find out uh, what the time is. When I got appointed to the DRC, I was told, oh, it's it's one twice a month or twice, two meetings a quarter. So I thought, okay, that's fine, I can do it. And I got appointed, oh, we forgot to tell you, and you know that's a bad thing when they tell you that. <laughs> We're two years behind on hearing appeals. So we met for a year three days out of the month. And they were eight to five. And luckily for my position, my job, my board of directors kind of looks at it as a job requirement. So I was able to do it. There was a woman on Southern California, the commission down there, her boss wouldn't give her, the, she had to take vacation time in order to sit on this commission. You know, now you want to use your vacation days to be hearing appeals, not really, so she just never showed up. And that puts a burden on the other members of that board of commission. And so you really need to make sure, and if you tell the, the governor's office, you know, I really want to serve, I can't commit to that much time, maybe there's another board of commission that you can serve in. And the other issue, someone brought up on conflicts. Um, there's a woman who I helped, we helped get appointed to the Behavioral Sciences Board. She was originally appointed to a water board. Because those are typically hard ones to, to get, find people that can get through the process. But she, her business was as a land use planning lobbyist in her local county. So she called me up. She said, my choice is take this volunteer position, give up my business, or, you know, what do I do? We worked with the governor's office and they ended up appointing her to something else because they saw that she was someone who was really committed to being part of the process. So you do want to make sure that you you make sure the governor's office knows that there are commitments. You know, Mary knows my story. I was like gung ho. I wanted to be on the medical board. I was through the process, and then um, my dear husband, who I adore, 
decided to go work for the California Medical Association as a vice president. And so I tried to convince the governor's office it wasn't a conflict. <laughs> they didn't quite believe it. Um, it's always the LA Times kind of thing. What would the LA Times say? They probably would say having the wife of someone who works for the doctors on the medical board is not necessarily the best thing. Um, but so it's not just your conflict with your if you're married, um, if your spouse or your parents. I think even on some of the disciplinary boards, if your parents or your siblings are licensees of that, sort of, you might be conflicted out. So you just want to do your due diligence so that you can be very forthcoming with the governor's office so that they have all the information. You know, I'm obviously not on the medical board, but was thrilled and happy to be reappointed by the governor to the commission that I'm on because I really enjoy it. So any last questions before we close out? Yes. When do these commissions commence and then end yearly? Um, I, I serve on a, I have a four year term. Okay. So I actually was appointed during um, under Schwarzenegger first. I served for two years while Governor Brown under his administration, even though I was a Schwarzenegger appointee. Now I've been reappointed under, so I had to reapply. Right. So I reapplied to the Brown administration, fill out the application, had to do the whole thing. And yes, you do have to fill out every single box or you get all these red flags that show up at the end. Okay. Uh, just to note, at the county level, they've kind of made it uniform so that um, all of the the commissions are on three-year terms, mm -hmm. um, and, and they were two, but it would be a three-year commitment. Yeah. I think there's a limit. Like, and I do, there's certain appointments, though, that you serve at the pleasure of the governor. Well, you, I kind of do serve anyways at the pleasure of the governor. I mean, he could, you know, decide my service is no longer needed. Um, and you do have to maintain, there is a gentleman who, um, under the Schwarzenegger administration, it went public. Guess what? He got the phone call. Thank you for your service, but because you are representing the governor, you're you're his appointee, um, and so you do want to take that. The other things to think about too is there are disclosure forms that you have to fill out if you're an appointee of the governor. Everyone familiar with Form 700? We heard that. So financial disclosure forms you fill out every year. Um, I have to do ethics training every two years. Now I have to do sexual harassment training. And so um, there are some things that you have to do outside of just your meetings, and it's important that you do that. Um, but it is, it's a wonderful experience, um, really, and, and working with this administration has been phenomenal. And so I really encourage you, you have zero to lose, really nothing to lose, other than maybe an hour, two hours to fill out the application. And you have no idea what could happen and what doors could open for you. But I will guarantee nothing will open if you don't fill out the application. And I do want you all to know, if you have questions, if you get home, feel free to email me. Um, you can get it through the website. I have my business cards. We really want to help you navigate the process. Well, I'll make sure you find out who the right deputy is to talk to. We get asked, I get asked a lot. I get lists, hey, do you know anyone who might be interested in this or this or that? And so we really want to try to make this as seamless and as easy as possible because, you know, you're making her job easier. You're making the governor's job easier because he really is about public service and wanting to make sure people can be involved. So any last questions? Yes. There's a vacancy and you're approved. Can you start right away or do all the terms start in January 1st or how does that work? Um, it, it kind of depends, I think. Okay. So uh, every uh, every board commission is a little bit different, um, so it depends on what the term is. There could be, some of them are term appointed for four years from the date of appointment. Some of them are term years that are set in statute, so July 1 of whatever, and then four years later, June 30th, it expires. So it just depends on what position it is um, on the start and the end date. Pleasure or, or yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, I think we started in January, and then my new appointment, when I got reappointed, it took effect in January of this year. Yeah, so, any other questions? Well, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for coming.
um, please apply either locally or at the state level um, because I really think you'd find it a very worthwhile experience. And thank you so much for having us here and for partnering. Thank you. Thank you.